Uh, welcome back now straight to the issue of the day. President Mohamed Buhari has approved increase in some taxes as his parting gifts to Nigerians as he runs off his tenure. It is the new fiscal policy measures for 2023. The FPM introduces additional excise duty ranging from 20% to 100% on alcoholic beverages, tobacco, wines and spirits. Nigeria will begin to tax single-use plastics while 5% telecoms tax has been approved. The taxes will take effect on June the 1st this year, immediately after the end of the Buhari administration. Financial analyst Shagun Shukbiton joins me now to discuss further on this issue. Many thanks for joining me, Shagun. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's just look at this uh, revised excise duty rate. Additional excise taxes ranging from 20% to 100% increase on previously approved rates for alcoholic beverages, tobacco, wines, and spirits have been introduced effective from June the 1st, just um, a day or so, or two days after the president leaves office. What does this really entail? Or what, will he, what would um, be the impact on the manufacturing sector, specifically on um, the alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages sector? Well, uh, I have always said, so before we think about or talk about um, the impact of this uh, policy, both the um, fiscal policy measures, you know, and, and this, uh, new approval from the president with regards to tax some of some additional taxes um, we we need to juxtapose this within the context of our reality the reality of nigeria and i think this is important because that will then enable us to relate with this issue uh better from a better perspective you know um in the last couple of weeks i've had reason to to talk about this so it's very instructive that it's coming up again that Nigeria's, one of Nigeria's biggest problems, you know, is, is, our, is, is the capacity of our government to generate revenues. It's one of our biggest problems as a country. Um, and I have always said that, you know, the, the much vaunted diversification of our economy um, is actually a mirage, it's a myth. It's not, that's not our problem. Our economy is very widely diversified. If you look at our GDP and the breakdown of our GDP, you find that, in fact, the much talked about dependence on oil revenues is, is not true. The, the reason the oil uh, oil appears to be a problem is because we depend on oil for majority for the bulk of government revenues. Um, so Nigeria has a revenue generating problem. Um, uh, just to demonstrate or illustrate this, our tax to GDP ratio as a country is three point seven percent. This is atrociously low. This is the lowest, more or less, technically speaking, is the lowest in the world, practically, because there are only six countries that have lower tax to, to GDP ratios after 2021. And those countries are four countries in the Arab, in the Arabian Peninsula, who do not tax their citizens at all. In fact, who actually give their citizens stipends on a monthly basis. And then two countries that are at war. Be, besides these six countries, Nigeria's tax to GDP ratio is the lowest in the world, is the lowest in Africa. Togo, Benin Republic, Ghana have far higher tax to GDP ratios. Uh, we have Togo having 20% tax to GDP ratio. The highest, highest tax to, to GDP ratio in the world um, is always fluctuates between Sweden and Denmark, and it always hovers between 45, 46% to 50%. So to juxtapose that against the 3.7%, you begin to see the enormity of our problems. So any policy that will enhance the revenue generating capacity of government must be encouraged. And, and it is within that context that my own perspective on all of this, you know, this recent policy uh, action by the president uh, comes from. So now coming back to the excise and duties on alcoholic beverages, spirits, and all of that, and you see increases of between 20 to 100%, you know, I have always actually advocated for this. I know people that uh, like their alcohol <laughs> may not really like this because obviously it is going to increase, you know, the, the, the retail uh, prices of these things and perhaps affect some people's dispos disposable income, affect 
um, man the manufacturing sector because obviously they would have to pass the additional cost increases that that means to them, to their consumers, which could suppress consumption. You know, so there is a wider economic implication of some of these things that I think the government needs to be careful uh, to, to play a careful balancing act on, but it's, it's an initiative in the right direction. I, am, I don't think it's been implemented properly. Uh, some guidelines that need to be followed are not being followed, but it's a move in the right direction. It just needs to be better um, implemented. All right, before I get into my next question, uh, something just a uh, thought just occur occurred to me as you uh, just rounded off your thoughts just now. You said it's a step in the it's a step in the right direction, but my question would be that uh, School of Thought believes that uh, adequate uh, you know stakeholders uh, consultation uh, was not done, and um, you know it was uh, it is actually ill timed. I don't know if you agree. Yes, absolutely. So that's why I said well. On the one hand, it's a step in the right direction. Oh. But on the other hand, there are, you know, the implementation approach uh, is faulty. Uh, there are a lot of things that haven't been uh, uh, done by the government in, in approaching this. Uh, again, for context, these things take effect less than a month from today. Today is the 2nd of May, and the, the president has approved a policy that will significantly um, impact the manufacturing sector, the uh, our productive sectors, our trading sectors, motor vehicles, telecoms, you know, almost every facet of our lives significantly. And he's, he wants those things to take effect in 28 days' time. That is unacceptable. That can't happen. Um, so, for example, what you've just said now, uh, the stakeholder engagement. Of course, you, you, you can't just slam taxes like this you know, on, on the economy and on, 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 on citizens without speaking with critical stakeholders. In this case, who are the critical stakeholders? Um, organized private sector, uh, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, NECA, you know, government must sit down with these people, convince them of the need for these policies, and then uh, present to them an implementation timetable, timelines that will ensure that they can also prepare they can also sensitize their own stakeholders. For example, if you are going to increase prices as a manufacturer of, say, beer or, you know, other alcoholic beverages or even tobacco, you want to send some sort of a notice to your um, wholesalers, your distributors. You know, a lot of these organizations don't deal directly with, 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 with the open market. They have large distributors. And those distributors are critical to their success. If you just slam a price increase on them without adequate notice, there is a multiply effect, there's a trickle down effect that would also impact their own businesses negatively. And they will have, some of them may have no choice but to seek other, other um, uh, partners, you know, to do business with, or some might even leave that business line entirely if the, if the uh, changes are too impactful to them, you know. So government needs to give all of the stakeholders time to make the necessary adjustments, implementing a policy you've just approved now in 28 days is yeah. unacceptable. Also, uh, there's a legal requirement for this. The, the, the um, um, uh, appropriate tax laws actually makes a provision for a 90-day notice okay. before increases in a lot of these taxes that government is trying to increase. So government really needs to look at this and all ensure right, so that they're... Let's talk about um, policy and direction and all of that, specifically for that of um, the telecoms and taxes or excise as it were. Uh, we're looking at 5% um, or so. But before now, we had like um, um, an approved rate for between 2022 to 2024, like a roadmap. It was approved sometime last year with the FPM. But right now, we're seeing another increment uh, when uh, the supposed 2022 to 2024 you know, has not actually elapsed. Well, so what happened, um, that particular um, law, the fiscal policy, me policy measure that you speak about that was approved in 2020, uh, the, as a part of the Finance Act in 2020, and that was gazetted um, sometime in 2022, last year, uh, was eventually not implemented. I think this must be, this must be made clear. So the te especially the telecoms tax part of it. So there was a bit of an outcry from telecom sector stakeholders and I think from sections of the general public, you know, for example, 
uh, there's an association of telecom subscribers, you know, and uh, those that association also spoke at the time. I recall very uh, clearly. And government then suspended the implementation of that policy. So I think what is happening now is that the government is trying to bring it back um, as a part of, you know, this new uh, document that the president has just approved. So it's not really, it hadn't been implemented before, so it's not as if there was a 5% uh, you know, introduced, 5% tax on telecoms uh, 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 spend that was introduced last year and we're introducing another 5%. That 5% was actually not implemented and it is that same um, um, tax that is now being reintroduced. But I think that everything that I said with regards to um, the timing, with regards to the notice as required by law, applies to this as well you know signing a, um, a policy into law or bringing out an, a, an approved policy on the on the 20 on on, on uh, what was on, on the first of may mm. you know for implementation on the on the first of june is illegal actually okay. and you know i mean people that want to sue the government can actually do so <laughs> all right Shago, let's talk it's about okay. uh comp requirement because as it is right now it is a bit still unclear how these uh, you know new taxes uh, would be administered specifically the, the federal government talked about uh, the green taxes you know they talked about single use and plastic and all of that so how do we know about um, the frequency of payment compliance some um, timelines penalties and detailed regulations these have not been clearly spelled out so typically what happens when government comes up with um, new um, policies, new laws like this is that there will then be um, further clarifications from the relevant um, government agencies, uh, parastatals or ministries. Uh, in this case, talking about the green tax, uh, what one would expect, first of all, there are two angles to this. There is the environmental impact, uh, climate um, readiness, uh, carbon zero impact, all of those things fall under the purview, I would imagine, of um, the Ministry of uh, Environment. And then there is a tax angle, you know, uh, which falls clearly and directly under the purview of the Ministry of Finance um, and the FIRS. So you would expect that there will be a policy clarification memos, uh, you know, um, circulars that will be released in due course before those tax, before this will be implementable. You know, so, like you say, at what point will this be, be, be applied? And, you know, when I say at what point, I mean at what point in time, as well as at what point in the value chain. Mm. So, who is paying this tax? Is this, is this tax being going to be payable by the manufacturers of um, the single-use plastics? Is it going to be man, uh, paid by the manufacturers of the impute, uh, high-density high poly polymers, HDPs, for example? Or... Is it going to be applied, you know, at the point of sale? So, so a lot of these things have, have not been clearly spelled out. And indeed, I think that they cannot. All right. So what we would expect to see is that there will be further clarification in the coming weeks from the relevant um, government agencies. One final question for you, Nashevo, <laughs> before uh, we'll uh, leave off um, this um, tax matters. Now, I'm still interested in the telcos uh, tax and all of that uh, because... Uh, Virtually all Nigerians will be, you know, affected in one way or the other by this. Do we see a situation where Nigerians will pay more for calls, for internet data, and of course for even SMS? No, I don't think so. I, I think that what this would mean would be that uh, the telecoms operators would absorb, you know, this this additional cost. It's a five percent. It's significant, but it's not something that they can't adjust for. Let's not forget that. The Nigerian telecoms, the Nigerian telecoms market, even though it's now about 20, 21 years old, is still far from being a mature market. In a lot of markets, mature markets, you know, in developed economies and in developed societies, voice calls are free. Oh. So we're still not in that place at all. Uh, a lot of those places, data is the source of revenue for telecoms operators. And voice calls are either completely free or heavily discounted, extremely cheap. You know, so I think that even though there is a counter argument with regards to operational costs in Nigeria because of our infrastructure challenges and infrastructure deficits, but I think that one can still argue that this, this uh, additional tax, uh, most likely because also of competition, right. you know, um, in, the, in that space, 
you, I do not see the telecoms operators having the courage to increase tariffs. They could do it in some underhand measure, in some underhand manner, oh. where they are not announcing those increases and just making careful small adjustments across their various uh, tariff platforms. But, you know, I don't think that they will All come right. out in the open and say calls will now be more expensive. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have been speaking with Shegun Shokbito, a financial analyst on the recently introduced tax by the federal government. We do appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. As we go today on the show, we'll leave you with this feature. Over 400 women in the Limosho area of Lagos State have received free digital training to scale their business. Uh, this form part of financial literacy and inclusion program organized by the She Enabled Project in collaboration with Google. Uh, details in this report. I am Justin Akadonia. I'll see you again next time. Bye for now. Women in Nigeria are highly interested in becoming entrepreneurs, but face unique challenges, including access to financial and business development services, as well as information that are critical to formalizing and growing their businesses. Really help, you know, well. She Enabled is a financial and digital inclusion project by the Ego Foundation, which seeks to empower women and girls living in underserved communities in Nigeria. Toluashe Olaniyo is the executive director. He speaks alongside others. It's um, designed to um, support women, uh, particularly women at the grassroots, um, to help them in terms of deepening their financial um, literacy, uh, financial knowledge, and also deepening their digital knowledge. If we have good education, if we have the same training the men do, in terms of from primary education, teach them, teach them digitalization, teach them digital transformation, how to move your business, how to scale up. And now with what's going on everywhere, you need to scale up. We have to create more methods to be able to help them understand why it's necessary to have some certain things in place and how those things can be beneficial. So for financial institutions, microfinance banks, insurance companies, the regular cluster, they need to be able to change the way they interact, document and how they promote their um, knowledge or disseminate information so that these people can actually benefit. The She Enabled Project addresses the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 1, 3 and 5, targeting unemployed females living below $2 per day. Some of the participants share concerns and opportunities. There are so many challenges out there, like one, though we are in digital world now, so visibility is part of it. Then secondly, at times financial support. The benefits are actually limitless because we are people from different categories of businesses. We do different things. I don't know when I'll need someone's services. So I feel that events like this will help us meet people outside of our own niche. The major problem is, is the same problem that, we're, that we have always had, right? Um, and we, 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 all, we need to continually um, re-emphasize it that, um, I mean, a lot of them feel um, that it's not needed for them as such because they feel that the home is built around the man. According to Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, Nigeria has the highest number of women entrepreneurs in the world. This high level of women's participation in entrepreneurship has been found out to be necessity-driven. Justin Nakadone, Plus TV News, Lagos.